I'm Erica Lynn, and we all know the ocean is the most demanding environment on Earth, consistently testing the reliability and durability of our equipment. When you spend as much time fishing as I do, you know that reliable gear is essential for staying on the water. This is why I went with Abyss Battery to power my trolling motor, electronics, and outboard. The guys at Abyss Battery are rattling the saltwater industry by manufacturing performance marine batteries specifically designed for sonar, outboards, trolling motors, and electronic fishing reels. They're also Bluetooth compatible, so I found check and battery statuses right on your phone while you're out on the water is a huge game changer. To learn more about why Abyss batteries are used by the pros and factory installed by Premier Boat Builders, visit abyssbattery.com. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Um, Mark Levesay is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I am talking to Gary Blessing. And Gary's got a very unique thing going on that I recently learned all about and talked to him. And after I talked to him, it's kind of funny. I didn't think I'd need to utilize his services at all. But then uh, I ended up giving him a call anyway. So Gary, before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit. So can you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Gary Blessing, I'm... Uh... I live in Morris, Illinois. Um, I, uh, I used to be a diehard deer hunter uh, for, I don't know, I think this, if I hunt this year, it'd be my 36th year in the in the deer woods with a bow. Uh, probably won't hunt this year. Um, I, uh, I was a diehard, uh, hardcore bow hunter for a lot of those years, um, you know, chasing deer and it was really my obsession my passion to do it and um you know just kind of got to a point where <laughs> i hate to say it but it almost kind of you know anticlimactic it got a little boring um it just wasn't exciting anymore it, it was more work than anything so you know i kind of i kind of turned to the to the tracking side of things and and i own uh, i own um a two woodworking businesses so i work you know by myself and so i'm allowed to take most of the time off that I can, um, doesn't work, always work that way, but I can take a lot of time off in October, November, and, and it allows me to track. And that's, that's basically, um, what I do. So, so, okay. So we're going to, we're going to get into that for sure then, because how long have you actually been doing the tracking thing? Is diesel your first dog or have you had other tracking dogs in the past? No, Diesel's my first dog. Diesel's two and a half, so this is our third season. Um, his first season, he was six months old, um, and uh, uh, this is definitely my first <laughs> my first go around. And I've certainly learned a lot in three years behind that dog. That's for sure. So, uh, in case pe- people haven't figured out, we're talking about tracking dogs. This whole episode is about tracking dogs, and with the rut coming up, this episode's coming out right away because we feel that it's very important to educate other hunters. On the ethics of the shot, the actions afterwards, and how that can help you recover your deer. And Gary and I have had a few conversations about this, so we think it's pretty important because a dog truly can help you if you take the right steps. But before we get to that, I still kind of want to get back into it a little bit more. Um, so you just kind of, I mean, did you ever use a tracking dog before, Gary? Or was it one of those things where you're like, oh, that'd be kind of cool? No, actually, I, I haven't. And, and it's kind of interesting because I've talked with a couple of friends of mine that, and it's, and it's weird, I haven't, I've lost a couple of deer in my life back in the day um, that I probably should have utilized a dog, but I didn't. Um, tracking has really just come on in the last, you know, few years. Uh, 
strong, you know, guys have been tracking with, with dogs for a long time, but it seems like here in Illinois, it's just, just coming on strong the last couple of years. But, um, um, there was an instance where, uh, my wife hunts and this was, geez, five, six years ago. And I was in the tree with her. Uh, she shot a deer, a really good deer, 155 inch nine pointer. And, uh, the, the shot was definitely liver. I recognized it right away. Um, and, uh, make a long story short, uh, we gave the deer, uh, six to eight hours and we tracked it at night, uh, and where it went, we, we just couldn't track it. Um, I lost blood. Uh, we tracked the deer for, geez, probably four hours. I think we got out of the woods at three or four o'clock in the morning. Um, and I just lost blood trail. We looked all the next day. We couldn't find it. And, and I said to her that night, I said, I'm never going to allow this to happen again. I said, someday I'm going to get a dog and we're going to, we're going to stop this. Um, and you know, just see if we can prevent anything like this from happening going forward. And, and, uh, you know, it just kind of, uh, that's sort of how it came about. Um, you know, I never, I never had this big grand scheme, you know, it was just kind <laughs> of a whim, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, I, I got, I got to a point with my, with my bull hunt and where I was getting a little bit, um, board and it was a little stagnant and I lost a, I lost a farm or two and it was just hunting was kind of a downer for me. And, and I thought back to a dog and the property that we have to hunt. Um, I thought I would just leave for my wife just because she loves to hunt. So I just, I'll just let her hunt and, and I'll get the dog thing and I'll venture into this. And, and that's, that's sort of how it took off. So, so it's pretty cool because I, I'm not like, I don't own a dog now or anything like that. I had a childhood dog when I was a kid and I'm not a huge dog person. I like dogs and my buddy's got a uh, Drethar, Dre, I, I don't even know how you say it, but it's one of the long Yes. Yep. And it's, it's yep. an amazing, amazing dog as far as hunting. I've never seen it lose a bird. Even if somebody, you know, wings one and doesn't quite get it, it that, that dog finds it. And, um, he's even, he's even found live pheasants that, that, that somebody else winged a few days before and, you know, he'll bring that back to you. And it, it's pretty cool to see. And I like it, but I found out I was allergic to dogs. So I just never owned one in my adulthood, but you know, yeah. and I could spend time around them and things like that. And, um, and I've always wondered, you know, how it's just, how good can a dog work? How does a dog work on a track and all those different things. And it was pretty neat because I was actually lining up podcast content and I talked to you and, I backed out of the woods because I have a rule that if, if I don't see the deer go down or I don't hear it crash, a hard crash, I'm not going to go after it and go looking for it. I'm going to give it some time. It's just, I mean, my buddies and I have done enough tracks on each other's deer to where we pushed them and pushed them to the point where you're out there until five in the morning trying to find that deer. And, and so I didn't want to do that. And I, I thought it was a decent shot when I shot that deer. And, and I happen to be talking to you, drinking a cup of coffee, just lining up podcast content while I'm wasting time. And you started asking me some questions. And then I almost started second guessing myself a little bit, but I'm like, no, it was a decent <laughs> shot. Well, how, what, and then you asked me, I believe you asked me, why did you back out? And I said, well, I saw good blood and I didn't know where it went. So I, I backed out and you're like, okay, you know, and, and I could tell just like, the tracker was coming out in you as I'm talking to you just about lining it yeah. up. And it was pretty interesting. Yeah. And, and then as we, before we hung up the phone, the one thing that you said to me is, well, if you have any trouble, just give me a call. I'll be around. And I was thinking, yeah, I don't need them, but okay. You know, <laughs> I told, I told yeah. you, okay. And then uh, I hung up the phone and what was it? Probably 45 minutes later, I went back out in the woods. And <laughs> <laughs> Not long. <laughs> the blood wasn't as good as I thought it was. There was, there was blood on the arrow. There was still blood on both sides, but I tracked for about 20, 20, not even 20 yards and I couldn't find any more blood. And so I gave you a call and then let's kind of just play it out from your perspective of how it went down from there. Sure. You know, I, I get that call, you know, nearly every day this time of year. So your call was second nature to me. I, uh, and the, and probably the first thing that I'll I'll say to that, and it's a really good point for everybody to understand, is that if I interview a hundred hunters, and if I ask ninety of them, if I ask a hundred hunters, if, let me repeat that, if I ask a hundred hunters where they think they hit, 
um, everybody's going to tell me where they hit. Some guys will say, hmm, I'm not really sure. Okay, fair enough. Good answer. The guys that say that I hit exactly right here, and I send them a little picture of a deer with a grid, and I say, okay, did you hit? And they'll pick out a number, D5. Okay. Um, and then we find the deer. It's nowhere close to D5. It's nowhere close to where they thought. They look at it and go, I can't believe. I thought I hit here, and I hit 18 inches from there. Um, so when I interviewed you, you know, w are you positive about the hit? Are you sure? And knowing 90% of the guys are going to be wrong. They're just going to get it wrong. <laughs> it's either adrenaline. It's excitement. It's, you know, I told my wife a long time ago when she learned how to bow hunt, I was teaching her. I said, when there's a deer in front of you, your brain turns to water, and runs out your ears. It's just what happens. Um, very few people can keep it all together all the time. You're going to be missing time. You're going to be missing space. So m knowing that most guys get the shot placement wrong, I'm thinking in the back of my head, number one, why is this guy, he, he backed out for two hours, which is absolutely perfect. And by the way, and, and we'll get into this more, but you, the reason that you recovered your deer that day that you did is because you did everything correct and the dog did what he was trained to do, and then both came together and found your deer. But so, <clears throat> um, so knowing that your shot was probably not what you thought it was, um, I'm going to err always err on the side of caution. So when I told you, I said if, if if you get in there after two hours and you don't like what you see, just get out because a dead deer is not going to go anywhere. If he's dead now, he's going to be dead six hours from now just that's obvious right <laughs> but if he's alive and you continue to push and you continue to put pressure that deer could get up and go a very long way so you know so from my perspective i assumed your shot placement was not what you thought it was um and err on the side of caution let's let's see what you find and hopefully you know, and, and again, you did the right thing because you didn't see what you thought you'd see. So you backed <laughs> up and called. So, But what's funny is when, when you sent me that picture and I told you, I said, you know, I know it's not in this zone or this region of it. And I know it, I knew it was over here and I was a little further back than I would have liked. And I told you where it was in the height. You're like, oh man, that's not good at all. You know, and you're thinking that's, that might almost be like tenderloin area or something, but it actually yeah. wasn't because no, I, I knew the shot angle and I was trying to explain it to you. I'm like, it was a kind of high shot angle. What I didn't realize is that buck had to have been, or before I released that arrow turned towards me just a little bit and quartered two. And yep. in my head, because I must've already been in that shot sequence, I never processed that, that he stepped and adjusted. And when I ended up shooting him, that quarter two is what actually kind of screwed me really. I mean, it, and it's my own yeah. fault because I was too busy focusing on my shot sequence to, to, I think to realize that. And what's funny is you said, when you saw the blood and everything, you're like, man, that might be like a one lung liver scenario there because there's a little bit of brighter blood and there's the darker blood on it too. And when, when we ended up getting to the deer, that's what it was. After you looked at it, you're like, yeah, I bet you that's one lung liver. And when I was processing it, take and yeah. field dressing it, that I looked at it and I'm like, holy cow. Yeah, that was exactly yeah. what it was. And in my brain, for some reason, I'm thinking, how did I only hit one lung? Because I aimed higher. So I would go through the top of one and at least hit the bottom of the other one. And, yep. and it just turned just a little bit and it, it made it to where it didn't happen. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's it people miss time and space it's just it it it's it's a phenomenon I, I i can't explain it but every tracker will tell you is that just guys are just get it wrong and it's just it it but the the thing is is to the listeners is that expect to have it wrong expect to not be right you know if you're absolutely certain no question about it there's no doubt in your mind yeah have a little bit of doubt, but it's, you know, that's different. But if you're, if you have any bit of doubt at all, assume the worst and you're going to be a lot better off in the, in the end. And 
it's you you played it safe you you did it exactly right i wish every hunter would do what you did <laughs> well that's why we're going to we talk would, about this <laughs> yeah we, we, there would be a lot less deer rotten in the woods um if hunters would do just be a little bit more patient and and, and go through just a a basic sequence of events so um, let's kind of let's let's talk about that before we get into the rest of the the tracking process that was involved with with my deer. Let's kind of talk okay. about what the steps a hunter should take, how they should possibly evaluate their shot, and exactly kind of what they should do. I know there's some like ground rules that if if everybody followed these ground rules, they would definitely be better off. Yeah, you know, and if I guess if you talk to different trackers, you'll kind of get a little bit, you know, the details a little bit different, but it, it, you know, basically what I tell guys at the end of a track, I don't, you know, I don't want to lecture them and I, I don't want to, you know, I, I sort of, I want to educate more than I want to, um, certainly lecture anybody. Um, I want to see them recover more deer. So at the end of a track, whether if it's successful or not, here's kind of what I go through is if you absolutely know by searching your heart and your soul that you absolutely know that you drilled that deer double long, maybe long heart. You saw it break the opposite shoulder. It was digging ground, it, you know, as it, as it tried to get away, you heard a crash. That's an absolute two hour minimum wait. Do not go in before two hours. I hear, I take, you know, I've taken 10 calls today and nine out of the 10 calls. How long did you wait? Oh, I waited a good half hour. <laughs> and, and the reality is, is that most deer are pushed by hunters in the first one, two, three, or four hours after the shot. Um, uh, a deer is going to run a minimum distance, 50 yards, 100 yards, 150 yards. And if they're hurt bad enough, they're going to bet up. And the guy coming 45 minutes behind is going to push that deer out of that bed. And that's when trouble starts. So I tell guys, minimum two hour wait, unless you see the deer go down, you know, and, and then after that, after the two hour wait, if you still think the shot is good, um, get in there and look at the hit site, look at the hair you've got, um, you know, look at, look at the blood. Is it lung blood? And if you don't know what lung blood is, search on Google, you know, get on there and see what lung blood looks like. Um, and if you've got lung blood and you thought you hit lungs, follow the track. Um, and if you sort of the next ground rule is, is if, you know, a, a double long deer is going to go a hundred, 150 yards, they can go farther than that, but 90% of those are going to drop within a hundred, 150 yards. So if you go beyond that point, so in other words, if you think you've got a double long deer and you go more than hundred, 150 yards and you still don't have your deer, there's something probably going on that you don't think is happening or no or expected to happen that's a good time to get out and and give the deer some more time again if the deer is dead it's still going to be dead six hours from now when you go in but if it's still alive and it's got enough gas in the tank yet it's going to get up and it's going to go and i think a lot of your listeners are are um public ground small ground hunters um and it's critical, it might be a critical part of the track is to keep that deer on the property that you have permission to hunt. And, and, and you know, it's, you know, a, a live deer can get up and if they feel good enough, if they know they're being pursued, they're going to put some distance. They could, it, it, if they're good to go, they could put a thousand yards on you in 20 minutes. Now you've got a thousand yards. You've got to track that deer. That's a half a mile. <laughs> hey, good good luck because the, you know that deer is has been in that bed now he's he or she has settled their heart rate down they've probably licked wounds they've they're going to bleed less they might still be fatally hit but if they're good enough to go and they're being pursued they're going to go and they're probably not going to leave a lot of sign behind so you know the, the the bottom line there is is that you know if you're if you're not seeing what you think you see get out if you come to a bloody bed, get out. Um, don't track. Get out and then call a call a nearest tracker. That's that's yeah. sort of the right. So um, 
it, it's kind of funny because I mean, I've, I've, I've had deer like that, that we've tracked him. We didn't find them until the next morning and we knew that they were, you know, uh, or actually we found one one time that was, we, we pushed it up. We kicked it up again after, you know, four hours we kicked it up cause it was just not where the shot was and, and backed out. And then we found him after we kicked him up, we watched where he went down and we just went back the next morning and found him right there. But it was to the point, I think I was telling you about it, that it was a drop here, a drop there across the road. And I mean, if you think about the fact that if a deer gets his heart rate settled enough to where he's barely bleeding anymore <laughs> and they're running and you push them, they could be running upwards of 20, 25, 30 miles an hour. <laughs> How much blood are you really going to have to find? That's a big, far spacing for a drop here and a drop there to find. And I guarantee you at nighttime, you're not going to find that either. <laughs> so no, and if you do, it's gonna, you're going to be lucky. Yeah. So I was, I mean, I was super curious about it. I didn't really understand it. I thought the dog actually tracked on blood. And, and I was thinking in my head, I'm like, man, this is going to suck. My instance, that day it was raining and it had like huge thunderstorms coming along the way afterwards. <sighs> And you're like, well, I'll be there around one o'clock. And I'm like, oh man, this is like, we're going to have like a solid hour of rain before he gets here. You pull up and you're like, yeah, it's kind of wet. You know, if you want to go, we'll go. But man, I think I'm going to go get some lunch and I'll come back. And I'm like, <laughs> hey man, it's your dog. <laughs> you do whatever you want, but okay. So, <laughs> so there I am and I'm twiddling my thumbs and I go sit in and in uh, my dad's house and I'm waiting you uh you come you call me and say you're on the way and I go outside and I meet you there and and uh you're like all right well looks like it's gonna slow down a little bit <laughs> you're doing your thing and I'm like this is crazy like how how is this dog gonna find it the 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 rain's <laughs> just washed it all away but you told me before you left you're like don't worry about it the dog the dog will be fine it doesn't need the blood and then, so as we're standing there, you started explaining it to me. Can you explain that to everybody, how it actually, how the dog works? Sure. Yeah. You know, everybody calls them, you know, blood trackers. We're not, dogs are not necessarily blood trackers. They, they certainly smell the blood. And if there's blood there, that's great. But really what the dog is focused on is the inner digital scent on the bottom of the deer's foot. Actually, the, there's a gland on the top of the deer's foot um, that, um, uh, the gland emits a waxy substance and it goes down the bottom of the deer's foot. And that's how they identify each other. That's how they know deer A from deer B and how deer A smells and where deer A has been. And um, so, and, and, and they can, they can sense a lot from that inner digital gland. It's a, it's a communicator. It's, it's something that the deer use to communicate with each other. They know where each other's have been. They know the direction they've been. They know if a doe is an estrus because she puts out a certain scent through that inner digital gland um, that tells everybody else, hey, guys, I'm over here. Um, and that's, you know, you see bucks trailing does, and a lot of times that's how they do it. Um, you know, and it's been said, too, that I think if you hunt long enough, everybody's been blown at by a doe, especially. And she'll sit there and blow at you, and she'll stomp her front foot. Um, and, and, and so a lot been said, and there's, and let me back up a little bit. There's a lot we don't know about deer scent. Okay. So a lot, some of this is speculation, but, um, when a deer is blowing at you and she's stomping her front foot, she's not necessarily making a warning sound. She's putting down warning scent through that inner digital gland. So every deer that passes through there, it's like a warning sign. You know, it's a big yield sign that says, Hey guys, be careful. There's something going on here. Um, so what really the dog is focused on and what we want to train the dog to do is follow that inner digital scent of that deer the same way that you smell differently than I do, than my buddy does. And, you know, if, if anybody that's got a house dog, if, if that house dog, for an example, you know, can't see or goes blind or whatever it is, they, they're certainly going to know when you walk in the house versus a stranger walks in the house because they know how you smell. It's the same thing to a tracking dog. That tracking dog knows how that deer smells by the inner digital scent. Um, and so the inner digital scent does something to a tracking dog too. And it's, it is very, it, it's, 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 it's so interesting is that when a deer is fatally hit, 
um, they will emit a lot of different scent through that interdigital gland and throughout their body that the dog picks up on. A lot of the stuff we know, a lot of the stuff we don't know, and we just sort of speculate about. But there, if you talk to enough trackers and enough um, uh, veteran dogs, they will tell you that your their dog will tell you whether your deer is fatally wounded or not fairly, you know, recent into the track. In other words, a dog's going to tell you by his body language whether he thinks the deer is dead or not, and he's doing that through that inner digital scent on the bottom of the deer's foot. It's so cool. It, you, you just have to see it. You so have to experience it. I saw that when you didn't say anything when when Diesel was there and and we we first went and you you put him on right where the deer was when the deer got shot. But you said to me afterwards, you're like, I knew he was going to find that deer as soon as he got on that spot because of his body language, the way he started flipping his head and already turned. And he he was, I saw him doing something, but I didn't know if that was like his regular routine or if he was really into something. And, and afterwards you told me he was, he was really into something that, you know, you knew he was going to get on him. And, uh, I mean, it was what, maybe like 10 minutes (laughs) and then, uh, and he found him. I mean, it was pretty crazy. The whole the whole evolution only took like maybe what half an hour, thirty yep. minutes or yep, something. Total. Yeah, it was yep. uh, it was pretty interesting. And so I'm kind of curious. So how does one figure out what type of dog to use? Or I mean, does it matter? Or no, there's 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 all kind of dogs in the tracking world. You know, you've got your your pre, your pure tracking breeds. Um, you know, your, your bloodhounds, um, are probably your most popular that your, that your listeners would think about when you think about a tracking dog, right? Everybody thinks knows the bloodhounds got a great nose. Um, diesel's a Bavarian mountain hound. Um, they're a pure tracking breed from Germany, Poland, uh, Europe in general. Um, and then you've got all kind of dogs throughout, you know, we've got, there's, a, <laughs> and Shout out to my to my Oklahoma folks. We've got a pug in Oklahoma that is just a stud of a tracking dog, and literally <laughs> he is a pound dog, and he's a he's part pug. We don't know what the other part is. It it really boils down to how much um, the dog wants to track. Dogs got great noses. Their noses are far better than ours, um, and it really comes down to how much the dog really wants to follow that scent line. There's, there's, there's a fantastic lab in, in the middle of Illinois. Um, he's just, he's just a, a, just a tracking machine. Um, you know, there's bloodhounds out there that are doing great. There's Bavarians that out there that are doing great. And there's cur dogs and Catahoulas. And I mean, there's just, there's all kind of dogs. It's, it's not really about the breed. It's about the want in that dog if they want to get to the other end of that scent line they're going to be good whether if it's a pug or if it's a bloodhound or a bavarian or hanoverian or a wire-haired dachshund that's if if they've got the drive they're going to make a good tracking dog so like um i mean is there like associations or something how how does one even go about learning or trying to get with the right individuals to kind of uh get get some knowledge on becoming a tracker or anything like that. It's easier these days than it has been in the past. Um, I belong to a, a, just a terrific organization, United blood trackers. Um, it's an organization that was spot, um, spawned a long time ago. I, I can't tell you that the year John and, uh, Jolanta Giannone, um, from New York, they really sponsored, they, they created United blood trackers here in the United States and um, they're really the the parents of um, wounded um, deer trackers and and, and animal trackers uh, here in the United States. Um, it's a terrific organization, a lot of tremendous uh, veteran trackers with a lot of knowledge, willing to spread it, um, willing to help out. Um, and you know that's it's it, it's it's definitely the biggest organization in the United States in terms of helping connect hunters with trackers and developing new trackers. So, um, United blood trackers, it's definitely something that, 
that people ought to look into if they're thinking about getting into uh, into deer tracking. Now, with that United Blood Trackers, is that the thing where you can actually punch in your zip code and it'll tell you a tracker that's in your area as well? Is that the same website? Yep. Yep, great point. It's uh, unitedbloodtrackers.org. And on top of the homepage, there's a link uh, called Find a Tracker. Um, and you can, no matter where you're at, you can click on that link and enter a zip code or a city or state, and you can see all the trackers that are close to you. And it'll actually give you, you know, if you punch in, you know, Morris, Illinois, it's going to give you, you know, Gary Blessing is zero miles, and it's going to just click down the next trackers at, you know, uh, Ray Holhan and, you know, Ashcombe at 38 miles. And it's just going to, yeah, um, and they're going to give you their numbers. And, and it, it's a terrific way um, for hunters that, maybe you've never used a dog before uh, or just don't know who's around them, um, go there and find out before you go in the woods next time. So you're, you, you know, you've got somebody around you in case you need them, but terrific so, website. Um, let's kind of talk about that then. Cause you mentioned the whole guidelines thing. That's kind of a good, a good point. You know, maybe something happens real fast or something like that. And the tracker doesn't get to tell everybody the guidelines of, you know, kind of, how to let the dog do its work or things like that. Can you kind of explain that whole process? And I may, I'm sure each tracker has maybe their own, but kind of just like an overview of what you should do or rules of thumb to kind of let the dog do its thing and work. Yeah. You know, when I show up to a track and, and, and again, this is probably the second time you're going to hear this, but when I show up to a track, I, I you know, um, number one, I, 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 we really hope that the hunters have done their part before we show up. And I think it's a really important point to take a step back and, and, and reinforce that um, the hunters are in charge of um, their recovery from the moment that they take the shot. Their actions after the shot are going to determine how, how successful that dog is going to be. Um, so it, it's not just about the dog there, but, um, you know, minimum two hours, et cetera, you know, back out, don't grid search, et cetera. You know, so w when you've got a dog there and, and each tracker is going to have their own sort of checklist that they're going to go over with you before you start. My checklist kind of goes something like this. Um, you know, um, you know, diesel is a Bavarian mountain hound. Um, you know, he, you know, we're going to, um, he's a very friendly dog, but when I get him out of the truck, you know, don't, uh, don't interact with him just to completely ignore him. Um, that's always a good rule of thumb anyway. Um, you don't necessarily, some of these dogs are, uh, are pretty high strung dogs. Um, some of them, some of them are very friendly too, but, um, they're there to do a job. Um, so when diesel gets out of the truck, you know, just completely ignore him. He knows what he's here to do. He's here to work. Um, and, uh, um, and just take me to the hit site. Now, one of the things that I tell that I tell a lot of people is that, <clears throat> you know, stay behind your tracker, um, stay behind me. Um, you know, if the if the dog circles back on a track, um, just stand still, just let them work around you, um, and just you know, if the long line is getting tangled around your feet, just kind of step over a little bit. <laughs> um, let the dog work. Don't be walking around. Um, it's not an A to B kind of thing. Um, a dog is not necessarily going to be put down an A and going to run to your deer. That's not necessarily how it works. And you found that out. Uh, there's a couple times on your track where I kind of told you just, just kind of hang out a little bit. Diesel's trying to figure out what your deer did here. Um, and actually your deer actually backtracked a little bit. <laughs> if he came in at 12 o'clock, he went out of that little circle that he did at 10 o'clock. Um, and it took diesel a while to figure that out. And I just, I told you then just be a little patient with us. So he's trying to figure out what's going on here. And then and obviously he figured it out because it was 30 yards later. Your deer was sitting there with his head up, um, <laughs> but you know, just stay behind the tracker. And one of the things that you can do for a tracker is when you're behind, a lot of times we're focused on our dogs because we want to look at the body language, study their body language. Are they tracking? Are they searching? Did they lose it? Are they liking what they smell? Are they not liking what they smell? Did he just, did he miss that turn over there when he turned his head? It, it's, it's a lot of things that we're focused on the dog. And a lot of times we don't have a chance to look down. So if you're behind the tracker and the dog 
you've got a lot of chance to look down. And if you can tell a tracker, I've got blood. Good. He, he's on it. He's going the right way. That's a big help to us because we're not going to see it all the time. Um, and then, you know, and, and I, I think, I think one thing to bring up too is, is that, you know, and I think I told you, um, is that if the dog is on the deer, if we do find your deer, do not approach the dog. Um, and I think that goes, you uh, know, a lot of trackers will, you know, they'll handle it differently and everybody, everybody's dog's different. But I tell everybody, do not approach the deer when the dog is on the deer. The dog thinks the deer is mine. Um, and he will defend it. Um, you know, it's not, you know, I, and I don't say that in terms of, you know, that diesel is mean or any tracking dog is mean, they're going to bite you. But, you know, some of these dogs can be possessive. Um, they worked awful hard and they think it's theirs. Um, and they can, you know, you, you just don't want a situation to turn bad. Um, so I tell everybody, you know, if we do find you deer, we're going to do a little deal. We're going to let diesel pull at the at the hind end of the deer a little bit and kind of get out his frustration. And, you know, just when I pull the deer off, then he pull the dog off, then he can go in. Um, but other than that, I, I think it's just stay behind the tracker, help the tracker you best you can and sort of stay out of the way a little bit. Um, but does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, and to, to compound on that a little bit, I mean, my deer only went, it was only 80 yards from where I, my stand was set up. So it's not like it went super far or anything like that. It ended up making a beeline, cutting hard, and went off. And I didn't know whether it went left or right in that direction at that point where it went um, because it went over a little little ridge. And it turns out it actually hooked a left and made a big circle and, and laid down it, probably about 80 yards from the stand. And that um, kind of interesting. We came up on them, and you would think one lung liver <laughs> – that after almost what seven hours or six out probably hours. six six and a half hours anyway by the time we got on him he was still there with his head up but he hadn't gone far i mean at one point i'm guessing he stopped to think about what he was doing that's where we found our two blood spots um yep. and then and then he just went and made a big circle and ended up bedding down and that's right where he stopped he stopped you stopped i was behind you guys and um it was kind of interesting. You're like, got him. And I was like, oh, really? And he go, yeah. And I saw you start backing up. And I'm like, huh, why, why is he backing up? And he, he's still alive, you're telling me. And I'm like, really? But Diesel was there <laughs> almost five, what, five five to ten feet away maybe? Probably ten feet away staring at right, yeah. right in the face. He was closer than he's you close. were. And <laughs> I'm thinking, man, okay, yep. if that deer didn't get up when he when he's right there with a dog in his face, he's obviously pretty well wounded, just not, not done yet. And then you came back to me and you're like, Hey man, I'm not going to tell you what to do, which I thought was pretty cool that, you know, you were reinforcing that. I mean, I knew what I was <laughs> definitely going to do. I was going to get that bow and put him down if I could get on him for sure. Um, yeah, but, yep. uh, I, I like that, you know, you were like, I can't tell you what to do. Don't want to tell you what to do, but I know what I would do. And I'm like, I know what I want to do. I'm going to go get it. <laughs> Yep. And I, I crept up on him. You know, I, I can't tell guys. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, no, go ahead. It's fine. You can't tell them what to do, obviously. I, right? I, 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 I can't tell guys what to do. I, I just, I, I hate to see a deer sit there and suffer. And it's within legal hours and you got a legal, legal weapon. Why not get another arrow in that deer? It's oh, just, yeah. It's no brainer. Yeah. So <laughs> I come back and I shoot him. And I creep up on him and put one in him. And you're like, well, was it a good shot? Because the deer actually... I shot the deer, the arrow passed through, didn't get up and move, but then it hit the arrow, hit a branch, bounced back and tapped the deer in the face. And he got up and ran then. And I'm like, what the heck? And he went maybe another 10 yards, if that. And, um, and you came up and you're like, you get him? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you're like, well, where'd he go? I said, he got up and ran. And you're like, he, he got up and ran. Was it a good shot? And I go, well, I'd like to tell you yes. I think yes. But after the last shot, who the heck knows? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. You, that second shot was absolute money. And I think you said later it was heart. And you took off the top of the heart. Yeah. Um, but shooting a bedded deer is not easy. How many times have you practiced shooting a bedded deer? 
I've actually never practiced shooting a bedding deer, but I have shot a bedded deer before. <laughs> so that was like the right. only time. So yeah. It's, it's, it's not a learned behavior. I mean, it's, it's, you, you want to get another arrow into the deer because obviously your deer was, he was done. It was just a matter of, you know, time. He, he didn't want to get up and any arrow in that deer was going to, you know, serve its purpose. Um, he was hours away from turning the lights off. Yeah. But, um, your, that, that second shot was absolute money. You know, I picked up your, I think I picked up your shaft and I went, yeah, this is, this is great. <laughs> We're going to find this one. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was nice, bright, so, bright blood. And, and, uh, oh yeah. And he went there and we, we ended up getting them and that's pretty much the end of the story, but it was uh pretty cool. I, I, I gotta say seeing the dog work, I had a different, and I always thought it would be cool to get a dog to do that and have a tracking dog track your deer and all those things. Never even knew where to find one. And then I, like I told you, I became friends with a guy on Instagram that had a tracking dog and I started talking to him and he pointed me your direction. He's like, realistically, if you wanted to do a podcast, it'd be really cool if you could, you know, have somebody local so you could get with the guy, see the dog work and fully understand yeah. it and be able to be able to communicate and do a podcast with them. And, and, uh, just so happened it worked out right Gary <laughs> and, and, and you know I was driving home from your track and I you know obviously I knew about the you know the podcast that we that you wanted me to do and, and it's great anytime that we can educate the public about you know how to use a tracking dog when to use a tracking dog what to do after the shot to maximize your odds of recovery and all that and, and I'm driving home thinking how could this scenario with you and I have gone any better because <laughs> We've, we've got a hunter that waited two hours after the shot, didn't rush in, even when he shot, thought the shot was great. He went in there and knowing the shot was pretty good or thinking the shot was pretty good, didn't like what he saw. So he backed out and called the dog. The dog came in, tracked in seven hours after rain with almost no blood and tracked right to the deer. It, it's an absolute perfect scenario. And, and I'm driving home going, there, it, it, it's it you, you couldn't have scripted this any better and and it's all on video for everybody to see um on on my page um uh facebook page and i published the uh the track on youtube so it's it's there for everybody to see um we're not making it up um it was it was great it, it couldn't have worked out any better and i'm glad that you got your deer and you know diesel was good and, and you were great and Everything's good. <laughs> and you That's were good too. To <laughs> so now, no, now what's cool though is I know that if I shoot a deer of a lifetime and for some reason it's just not going right, give it the time and I'm going to call Gary. And Gary is living up to his name. He's truly a blessing to people in the woods, especially right now. I'm sure there's a lot of people, you know, heartbreak and misery and sleepless night until they can go back out and get it and, and, the cool part about this yeah. is that Gary is doing this for free. He doesn't charge. Him and Diesel work off of yeah. tips. So when when he's yeah. doing this, it's it it's free to you. It's it's a service that he's providing because he's getting out, he's getting to work his dog, he's getting to learn from it, and it's something that he loves doing and he's sharing it with you. So why not utilize somebody that's willing to just come out and be a blessing, a Gary blessing for you and do that. So, um, yeah. Gary, I, I thank I you. <laughs> I would say a dollar for everybody person that said that to me, but yeah, I, no, I appreciate it. And, um, and you know what? And you know what? Look, here's the deal. There, there are guys all across the United States that are doing the same thing that I'm doing. I'm not doing anything differently than anybody else is doing. There are guys <clears throat> excuse me, that work their dogs all summer long, practice tracks and obedience, and, and they, they, they put in the hours and the dedication. It takes a lot to own a tracking dog. If you want a good tracking dog, it, it, it's not just buying, well, I'm just going to go get a Bavarian Mountain Hound and, you know, and he's going to track deer for me. That's not what it is. And, and you become, you spend so much time with these dogs, you become you're, they're your best friend. And, um, um, Diesel's definitely my best friend. We, we spend every waking moment together. Um, and it, we just love to see our dogs work. Um, and 
Um, and we want to find guys deers. That's it. Period. Um, it's not about making money. Some guys charge, um, and it's probably something we should probably talk about a little bit. Some guys charge a fee. Uh, I personally don't, um, I don't, I don't know what the percentages are. Um, you know, most of us don't charge a fee, but take gas money or tips. Um, we do have expenses on the road. You know, there's a lot of gas money and there's a lot of meals in the truck and there's a lot of time <laughs> away from work and away from family. And, you know, you know, I, it's just this time of year, my wife is sort of divorced um, <laughs> and she knows it. Um, she's off doing her thing. She's working and hunting and I'm off tracking. But, um, you know, I think I filled up the truck three times this week, um, you know, and it's not about the money, but we just love to find guys deer and it's, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a labor of love. So, so. No, I think it's, I think it's really cool. I think it's awesome what you're doing. And so before we wrap this up and we go here, um, if you could tell everybody just one more time where they can find you, find your content and even find the video of my deer that diesel tracked. And if it, people haven't figured it out right now, it's diesel is the dog that did it. So, um, just kind of lay it all out for them where they can find you, find everything and, and find diesel and start following them and, and, uh, liking his content. Cause it's pretty cool. Um, I, diesel's Facebook page is diesel, the deer tracking dog. Um, and his YouTube page is diesel, the deer tracking dog. Also, um, I track out of Grundy County and I say, I track out of, you know, 60 miles from Grundy County, but you know, um, um you know, if, if you're anywhere near there, um, my phone number is 815-600-0650. Um, and you can find my number on, um, on our Facebook page at diesel, the deer tracking dog. Um, and you know, and, and here's another thing too, is that, you know, uh, what I tried, the content that I try to put on diesel's page this time of year is recoveries. You know, everybody wants to see, you know, guys with the grip and grin on the, <laughs> on the, uh, uh, you know, pictures, you know, behind their deer, but, um, you know, during the summertime, we do a lot of practice tracks. I film all our practice tracks on, on GoPro. So guys kind of get an idea on, you know, um, what the dog is capable of. You know, I do practice tracks in the rain. So hunters, you know, can kind of get an idea on, you know, sort of hopefully the light bulb goes off and says, Hey, I remember watching a, uh, a track, um, watching diesel track in the rain and it's raining now. And, you know, so I, I try to, I try to put out there what, you know, all the work that goes into a tracking dog and, um, you can watch all them videos. And I, I think I've got some, some obedience work on there too, but, um, but that's, that's where you can find us. Now, um, on, on it is the spelling tracking as in like T R A C K I N G or is it track in like, I thought maybe it was yes, a little bit different. T R A C K, yeah, T R A C K apostrophe N. Diesel, that you're tracking, dog. Yeah. So just so uh, everybody tracking. knows that, I want to make that clear because otherwise they might not be able to find them. Because I typed in tracking dog on YouTube and I didn't find them right away, so I had oh, to, I had to click on the link gotcha. from uh, from the Facebook page. But Gary, I appreciate gotcha. you coming on. It was awesome talking to you. Awesome seeing it. I suggest everybody goes and checks out the video of uh, him doing all the different tracks and stuff and watch mine too. Just don't try and deer shame me on, on my buck, but, <laughs> but uh... <laughs> there's nothing wrong with your buck. And, and you know, and, and you know, Luke, that's, that's another great point. A lot of times, you know, I, I get calls and guys ask me, Hey, do you track does? Of course we track does. We, you know, it's not, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't care whether if it's a buck or a doe, we, you know, I just want to see my dog's tail wag and, and, and shake the hunter's <laughs> hand. That's all I want to see. So we, yeah. we don't care what it is. All right. Yeah, it was awesome. Gary, it was good talking to you. And uh, hopefully everybody checks out your content and your phone doesn't ring too much. <laughs> <laughs> it will, but thanks, Luke. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Gary. Yep. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show.